I'll just say a few words before we get started. I want to say that it's great to see see Mike again. Uh, I'm just sorry we didn't have had a chance to see you at the academy, or won't have a chance to do that, and we missed the spring meeting. So things have been a little bit difficult at this time. But thank, thankful we do have uh, ways of getting together and having these meetings and discussions. Uh, I've known Mike since he was a medical student. Uh, it was just a couple of years ago, I guess, Mike. <laughs> but anyway, known you since you were a medical student. You came over, you were going to USC, of course, and uh, would come over to the Institute and uh, spend time with Fred Lenthicum, uh working on some research projects. And then, of course, you went, did your residency and came back and joined us for another uh, fellowship time at which time you continued a lot of your research. So you've been always very much on the forefront of, of otology and otology research and very active clinically. So I'd like to introduce Mike McKenna, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, gene energy, in, in engineering uh, role of um, genetics in, in, uh, middle, in hearing loss. Mike, take it away. Well, thanks, John. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I mean, John pretty much laid it out. Um, I'm a Southern California kid who um, uh, discovered otology um, serendipitously. I was assigned to do the class notes for a lecture given by Howard House. And, um, you know, um, it was just, you know, you know, the class note service, you know, you, you're called to take notes, you know, maybe um, twice a year. And I have been assigned to a talk given by Howard. And of course, um, all of those of you who know or knew Howard, um, uh, fabulous um, speaker, but he didn't talk anything about science at all. This was all about um, his path and how he, you know, got to be where he was. And it's a fascinating story, but part of the, um, the uh, agreement for the class notes is that you had to have whoever gave the lecture sign off on them to say that they were in fact representative of what the talk was. So I drove from um, the medical campus uh, over to uh, the office. At the time, it was not the House Ear Clinic, it was the Old Logic Medical Group. And, um, and it was quite a different building than uh, they're in now. And uh, Howard invited me in, took me into his office in the back and sat down with me. And um, he asked me what I was interested in. And I really didn't know at that time, I was a second year student. And I said, well, I think I'm interested in neurosurgery. And Howard said, you know, you should come and spend a few weeks with us, you may really, enjoy seeing what we do. And th that was not a typical rotation in medical school. I had to actually set it up. And as a medical student, I came and watched um, uh, Howard and Bill and Daryl and Antonio De La Cruz um, and others. And I fell absolutely in love with what they were doing. And that resulted in a career choice changed that I have never regretted. Um, so I ended up um, in uh, an academic practice at the Mass Ear for about 35 years. Um, I was a professor at Harvard Medical School. I was the division director for otology and neurotology. And I also, for a long period, I founded and, and ran the neurotology fellowship. Um, in 2016, um, uh, I, uh, along with some other colleagues, including Richard Smith, which many of you know, um, formed the Kuos, which is an inner ear gene therapy company. And as things really started to take off, I uh, stepped away from clinical practice about two years ago. And now I serve uh, the role as um, uh, chief medical officer. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it is that we are working on. 
So you should know that um, I, there is a conflict of interest here. Um, I am uh, both salaried and have equity interest in the company. So um, what we're gonna talk about this morning um, is gonna be a brief overview of what gene therapy actually is, um, the role of AAV, which stands for uh, adeno-associated virus, uh, the uh, use of this particular vector and how it's ideal for use in, uh, for the inner ear. We're gonna talk about the importance of the delivery approach, which includes both the surgery and also your choice of vector. Um, and what some of the potentials are to use uh, gene therapy to address some of the problems of the inner ear and what can all of us do to help expand this option, these options uh, for our patients. So just a brief overview of um, genetic uh, hearing loss. So tens of millions of children worldwide with monogenic hearing loss. Uh, congenital hearing loss is recognized as a neurodevelopmental emergency by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and hence the reason why we do newborn screening on all children born uh, in the United States and now most of Europe. Some of these forms of monogenic deafness um, affect as many as 200,000 individuals in both U.S. and Europe, so JGB2, Connexin 26 is one of those. And most importantly, there are no drugs currently approved for treatment of sensory neural hearing loss. Now, if you take all hearing loss across the entire population, genetic hearing loss is probably about 5%. But if you look at the population of children born deaf, um, about 80% have an underlying genetic cause. And most of those are non-syndromic, and the great majority of those are autosomal recessive, which means that most of these patients were born to hearing parents. They inherited um, uh, two pathogenic alleles, um, which results in their hearing loss, but their parents are generally uh, hearing. Um, more than 75 genes have been uh, identified as uh, associated with uh, autosomal recessive non-syndromic uh, hearing loss and more than 48 at present uh, for autosomal dominant hearing loss. So what is gene therapy? Essentially, gene therapy seeks to modify or manipulate the expression of a gene or alter the biological uh, properties of cells for therapeutic use. So um, in gene therapy, uh, there are a number of different approaches that are used. So for example, as I just mentioned, for autosomal recessive um, disorders where patients have bioallelic pathogenic mutations, um, you uh, would might consider um, adding back a normal functioning copy of the gene that is affected. Um, and we're gonna talk about some examples of that in a few minutes. And in order to do that, um, you have to be able to put the gene uh, into a vector. Um, and most of these nowadays are viruses. And then it's the virus that um, carries the gene uh, to the cell, target cell, um, and gets within the target cell and delivers the gene product. Um, there are a number of different viral vectors that are in current use, including uh, adeno-associated virus, adenovirus and lentivirus or retroviruses, and we'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of those. There are also vectors that are not viral in origin, um, and those are shown in the figure on the left, including liposomes. Um, the advantage to these non-viral vectors is they tend to not be as immunogenic, but the downside to them is that they do not have the very specific tropism that you see with viral vectors which allow them to um, get into specific uh, cell types. These will, these will get into essentially any cell they come into contact with. Um, gene therapy can be divided into uh, two basic types, um, ex vivo uh, and in vivo. Um, so ex vivo is where you remove cells from the patient, uh, usually stem cells. Marrow is a common uh, 
uh, source for these, and then they're grown in culture. The uh, 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 transgene is introduced in a viral vector uh, into the medium. The cells become transfected, and then those cells are put back into the body. Uh, versus in vivo is where you directly inject the virus and um, the vector and transgene into the patient, and that could be either systemically for some applications like hemophilia, uh, or it can be local delivery, uh, for example, for the eye for some inherited retinal disorders, and that you'll see in a minute is sort of the approach that we are using for use in the ear. Now for the ex vivo approach, um, one of the common viruses that is used is lentivirus. So lentivirus is a retrovirus. It actually incorporates into the genome. Um, and what that means is every time these cells that contain the transgene divide, the transgene is duplicated and, and both the cells uh, that result in from the mitosis contain the transgene. And that's very different, as you'll see in a few minutes, from, for example, adeno-associated virus, where it is not an integrating virus. So the transgene goes into the nucleus as a nucleosome, but when the cells divide over time, the, that um, transgene is not replicated, and so um, you eventually lose expression uh, through dilution uh, from cell division. So um, these are three of the common um, viral vectors that are used. And we're gonna, after this, we're gonna talk mostly or only, only about AAV. Um, AAV has been administered in hundreds of patients. It has a generally um, very good safety profile. Um, just recently, however, there have been a couple pediatric deaths for large scale systemic delivery. Um, but uh, that doesn't seem to be as much of a problem for local delivery. Um, it is a non-pathogenic virus, so this virus um, lacks all of the machinery in order to replicate its own genome and get out of a cell. So if it gets into the cell, it doesn't replicate, it doesn't uh, cause uh, pathology to the cell. In fact, when it was first discovered, it was discovered in association with an adenovirus, and it turns out that the adenovirus, for, for the AAV to um, replicate and get outside of the cell, it has to have some help from helper genes that are present in adenovirus. So if there's no adenovirus, it is a completely non-pathogenic virus. And as I mentioned, it persists episomally in the nucleus, has a very low integration rate into the um, host genome. In non-dividing cells, and that basically represents all of the cells within the cochlea, they're all terminally differentiated post-mitotic, um, one single delivery can result in lifelong expression because the cells don't divide, so there's no dilution of expression. And um, it turns out that um, some of these AAB vectors uh, very efficiently transduce inner ear cells in uh, multiple animal models. Um, downsides to the AAV, um, the manufacturing process, which is really critical in, in gene therapy, is a little bit more finicky than it is with some of the other uh, AAV vectors, as are the associated analytics. And probably the, the biggest limitation is that um, AAV is a small virus and it has a limited packaging uh, capacity which is about 5 KB, and that's significantly smaller than a lot of the genes that we might be interested in. And we'll talk a little bit about how we get around that problem in the ear. Uh, lentivirus, um, larger uh, packaging capacity. It does integrate into the uh, host uh, genome, um, but in doing so, it has stable expression even in dividing cells because the transgene is replicated in all of the future generations. Um, it does have a higher risk of insertional mutagenesis. So anytime you're, you're cutting into the genome and inserting a, um, uh, a segment uh, of DNA, there's a chance that that will result uh, in a mutation uh, that could have adverse effects, including um, uh, potentially 
uh, development of malignancies. Uh, adenovirus uh, vectors have also been used, and in fact, you'll see in a minute, the very first gene therapy trial in humans, which was carried out by um, Novartis um, with Heinrich Stacker, one of my former fellows uh, who was really leading uh, that project, has a larger um, uh, packaging capacity, a little simpler manufacturing, um, but one big problem is gene expression is transient, doesn't last um, for a long time, and it's much, much more immunogenic than is uh, AAV. So um, adeno-associated viruses were first discovered in uh, the mid-60s, and there's been a tremendous amount of research and development uh, which has occurred over time. Uh, it, was, it was recognized very early that this might be an ideal vector for gene therapy because it was non-pathogenic. And eventually this technology was developed. Um, clinical trials in humans using AAV began in around 2005. Um, the first uh, uh, product to be approved uh, in Europe uh, was uh, Glybera, which was used to treat a very rare uh, disorder of lipid metabolism, uh, was not approved by the FDA uh, in the United States. They had some concerns about efficacy. 2017, Luxterna became the first FDA product um, approved for use um, for rare retinal diseases. And then more recently, uh, Zolgensma, uh, was approved by the FDA and also more recently the EMA uh, for treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. And if you've ever seen the, um, the videos on this, uh, honestly, the first time I saw it, um, I don't think there was a dry eye in the room at the end. So these kids, it's a devastating disorder. Um, these kids uh, usually die by the age of two. Um, they can't move. They're uh, bedridden. And although they're not completely normal after treatment, um, it's really a dramatic change um, in their uh, quality of life. It becomes a life certainly worth living um, for these kids and their parents. So uh, really um, dramatic effect. So at present, um, there are over 70 uh, AAV gene therapy trials underway um, in the United States and Europe. And as you can see from the um, graph on the left, the number of uh, trials uh, is escalating uh, rapidly uh, in time. About half of all the clinical trials using AAV um, are in the eye or in the CNS. Um, so. 50% uh, are in uh, these, a similar closed system as is the ear. So we talked a little bit about Luxterna, um, first FDA approved in vivo gene therapy treatment for rare uh, inherited retinal disorder. Results with uh, uh, Luxterna have really been dramatic. Um, the efficacy in the first clinical trial was I think 28 of about 30 patients showed a significant gain in vision as a result of this. And we talked a little bit about Fulgensma um, for the use of um, spinal muscular atrophy. So for this condition, it's a systemic administration and it involves actually large amounts of vector necessary to treat these patients when you use a systemic uh, route of administration. And as I also mentioned, the very first uh, inner ear gene therapy conducted in humans uh, was done by Novartis. It was a phase one, two study initiated in 2014. Um, I do not think that the data from this was very compelling as Novartis has chosen not to continue to pursue this. Um, they delivered the vector was in a uh, adenovirus, um, not AAV, and the reason why is because at the time that this study was conducted, um, there was no evidence that AAV could um, transduce uh, the supporting cells, which is the target for this um, 
uh, hair cell regeneration. So they were delivering ATO1 in an adenovirus uh, vector uh, with the expectation that it would transfect the supporting cells and that this would then lead um, to uh, uh, formation of new hair cells. Um, there were some problems, I believe, with their approach, uh, delivery approach, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So the way they administered the uh, virus, this was a trans-canal procedure. Uh, drum is elevated. Uh, a small microstapedotomy was made in the foot plate, and then they had a cannula, which they um, inserted into the hole in the foot plate and then delivered uh, their vector. And as you'll see in a minute, there are some problems uh, with that delivery approach. So one of the um, great opportunities we have in the ear is we can leverage our learnings from what has gone before, especially in the eye and in the brain, which is about 15 years ahead of our field in terms of gene therapy. But there are similarities and commonalities between um, all three of these systems. So for one, um, they're all in an enclosed compartment. So that allows for the direct delivery of your gene therapy product to the organ itself. Um, the, the advantage to that is it requires orders of magnitude less vector in order to get um, high concentrations within the organ, um, much, much less than is required for systemic administration. And it also prevents the um, virus from getting out into the general circulation and it reduces the chance for there being off-target effects as it is um, really enclosed within the space. There's reduced immunity in the ear like there is in the eye and the CNS. And this is very important because um, these uh, AAV vectors, um, most are naturally occurring. So there's a certain subset of the population that are gonna have uh, antibodies uh, to the virus, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And it turns out that for systemic administration, if a patient has um, high levels of neutralizing antibodies, it won't work. It blocks um, uh, transfection. Um, and it, in the eye, if a patient has a uh, high titer of neutralizing antibodies in the serum, uh, the application of the uh, vector to the eye does not, is not impacted by the fact that there is circulating neutralizing antibodies. And so uh, because of that, we don't have to be as concerned about that. And that is a very big deal in uh, systemic applications for gene therapy. And finally, um, all of the cells within the inner ear are non-dividing. And what that means is if they're non-dividing, a single administration of AAV uh, vector um, should result in lifelong expression. So this should be a one-time treatment uh, that should last uh, the life of the uh, cochlear cells. Now, you can't help but ask the question, why has the um, uh, ear lagged so far behind other fields when it comes to gene therapy? And there, I think there are some pretty good reasons for that. So one is that um, uh, the inner ear contains a diverse population of cells, all of whom uh, express genes that are implicated in different forms of hereditary deafness. So, you know, it's not just good enough to be able to get into hair cells. You really need to get into the target cell uh, where you know that that gene is expressed or, or its product is not being expressed as a result of a genetic mutation. And so in order to get into a broad um, spectrum of different cell types, you need specific vectors that are uh, have specific tropism for those particular cells. And the other is just the basic surgical access, which I think has caused a lot of people to shy away from this. Um, as most of you know, it has been you know, kind of taboo to think about actually opening the inner ear and injecting drug directly into the inner ear. And most of the other companies that are working on developing um, drug products for the uh, inner ear have settled for a 
uh, trans tympanic approach where they're actually putting drug within a gel and injecting the gel into the middle ear with the hope that the product will diffuse through the round window membrane. And then once in the basal portion of the cochlea will then continue to diffuse from base to apex. It turns out that diffusion is really not very good to rely on. It's a very steep concentration gradient um, and it doesn't get your drug from uh, base to apex in all cases. It also turns out that the inner ear in primates, humans and non-human primates, and this is very different than virtually every other species that we have worked with, it's a relatively closed system. So, um, you know, when we do a stapedectomy, the great majority of time we make a hole in the footplate, we don't get a gusher. In every other animal species, if you make an opening into the inner ear, you get a gusher. And uh, so, but being a closed system, you cannot just infuse volume into the cochlea without it resulting in uh, pressure changes, which can be very deleterious. So I'll talk to you in a minute about how we, we get around that. So um, the approach that we envision in humans is very similar to what was done in the Novartis trial with a few exceptions. So we envision this as being a trans-canal approach. We have developed a re relatively simple device that is fashioned like other ear instruments, almost like a rose and needle. Um, it has a very fine needle at the tip and a little stopper to prevent it from going uh, too far in uh, to the cochlea. Um, and what we do is the, um, this is a trans-canal approach, exploratory tympanotomy. Drum is elevated, reflected forward. First step in the procedure is to make a hole in the stapes footplate, similar to what they did in the Novartis trial, but we don't administer through that hole like they did in the Novartis trial. Um, the device goes through the round window membrane, the surgeon holds it in place um, for about a minute while volume is being instilled into the cochlea, and the hole in the footplate is in fact a pressure vent on the other side of the cochlear partition so that now when we inject um, a vector through the uh, round window membrane, because we have vented on the oval window side, you get longitudinal flow of the vector all the way down the cochlea from base to apex and then back up on the scala vestibuli side from apex to base. And what that does is it allows for us to achieve a very uniform dose a vector across the entire length of the sensory epithelium. If you relied on diffusion, it would not get from the uh, base to the apex, but by actually instilling the fluid into the ear and venting on the scale of the stibuli side, we uh, fill the entire uh, cochlea with uniform vector. And then after the device is removed, we either put a small tissue seal over both of the openings or in non-human primates, we've been using Helon, which uh, seems to be very effective as well. We have done this now um, in over 100 um, non-human primates and the procedure itself is very safe. We don't see uh, significant damage to the um, sensory epithelium. We don't see loss of hair cells with the single exception of we do see a little loss right in the very most basal area of the cochlea, um, which we think is related to the insertion of the needle, but it, it only um, represents a very small fraction of the cochlea. The remaining portion um, shows no sign of any, any damage. Now, the other challenge um, to uh, the um, delivery, other than the surgical procedure itself is finding the right vector um, that has the properties that allow it to very efficiently get into your target cell and results in um, very um, uh, efficient uh, transfection and transduction. So one of the founders um, of Akuos is um, uh, a fellow named Luke Vandenberg. Um, Luke is one of the pioneers in vector development in gene therapy. And what Luke did 
was he looked at all of the naturally occurring AAV vectors, many of which are currently in use, and he looked at their sequence um, homology and um, sequence differences and was able to computationally derive the ancestors of these viruses. And these ancestors are not um, uh, present in nature uh, at this point in time. They may have been, you know, a million years ago, but they're not not at present. The idea behind doing this was what Luke was interested in was to find some vectors that would work efficiently in a number of different areas. Um, but since they didn't exist in nature, there would be no um, neutralizing antibodies and, and that would um, circumvent a big problem in gene therapy in general. Although there is some cross reaction between antibodies to some of the other vectors um, and these so-called ancestral um, synthetic vectors. One of these vectors is um, what we call ANC80, and you can see it on the um, uh, figure to the left. So again, this was derived with the idea in mind that it may be an efficient vector, but um, wouldn't have problems with neutralizing antibodies. It was not at all um, derived with the idea in mind that this would be ideally suited for use in the ear. It just turned out that empirically, when it was tested in the ear, uh, it had a lot of um, properties that made it very attractive for inner ear gene therapy, including broad tropism across multiple different forms of uh, different uh, inner ear cell types, has a really high uh, transduction efficiency in the inner ear, ear and um, uh, also offers some tropic advantages as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. So um, ANC80 was first uh, studied in mice, and that's the figure on the left. Um, and this has been published, and it was, there was a direct comparison of some of the other commonly used AAB vectors as well as ANC80. And what we found was that um, that ANC80 was more efficient at getting in to both inner and outer hair cells than were any of the other vectors. AAV1 is very good at getting in to inner hair cells, but not so much outer hair cells where ANC80 um, uh, efficiently transfected both. So there are multiple examples in the gene therapy uh, literature of, of vectors that work really well in a mouse, but when you get up into non-human primates or humans, uh, not so much. And so um, with the mouse data, we went on to test this in three different non-human primate species. So cyno, rhesus, and baboon. And we saw that the, the same transduction patterns uh, were present in the monkeys as was in the mouse, and it was conserved uh, across all three species. So this gives us some confidence that this should be the same for humans uh, as it is for the monkeys. Um, the other thing that um, was discovered um, was that uh, in addition to hair cells, both inner and outer, we see transduction of multiple um, other cells within the cochlea including um, supporting cells, so inner border cells, pillar cells, uh, Henson cells, Claudia cells. Um, uh, the ANC80 uh, virus gets into all of those very efficiently. And, in, and a particularly interesting group of cells that may have um, therapeutic implication, uh, you see on the bottom panel, these are the satellite glial cells that surround the spiral ganglion. So you can see that these cells also um, pick up the virus and um, uh, the, we, we use um, green fluorescent protein as a marker here. So uh, that's, we put that in as our transgene. And if the cells are transfected, they express uh, GFP and we can easily see that um, with the confocal. So with the ability to transfect multiple cell types, not just hair cells, it opens up the landscape for a number of different genes uh, or gene defects that we could um, possibly approach this way. And that's what you're seeing in the figure on the right. 
Um, so instead of it just being a few disorders, now we're looking at the potential for multiple different disorders. Um, and we think that this is a tremendous advantage. So um, what you're looking at here, this was a study that was done in the um, Sinos. Uh, and what you're doing, what we're doing here is we are um, uh, taking a GFP uh, transgene, putting it into ANK80 and delivering it at um, three different doses. So there's six monkeys, um, uh, two per group, and um, starting off at uh, relatively very low concentrations, which is 1.5 E10, and going up to 2.5 E11. And what you see here is that when the dose gets up to 6.0 E10, um, you see that uh, inner hair cell uh, transduction of between 75 and 100%. And that's unheard of in other areas of gene therapy to get this high uh, transduction rate. One of the things that you'll notice here um, is that in the low dose, where you sort of see what looks like a dose response curve, um, you can see, you see that the uh, inner hair cells in the apex are more efficiently transduced than the inner hair cells in the base. And that was very interesting to all of us, and many people in the field have seen this, um, because the um, injection site is at the base, and you would think that um, you would have higher transduction uh, the closer you were to the site of injection, but it's, that's not the case. The um, apical hair cells seem to be much more efficient. And we don't know the reason for that. I mean, I've heard several different hypotheses as to why that might be the case. Um, but the, the bottom line is we really don't know. And the important thing here is that if you look at what you're seeing at 6E10, where you get almost 100% transduction of inner hair cells, that's a relatively low dose of vector. And, um, and because it is so efficient at transducing hair cells, it opens up the opportunity um, to uh, use what's called a dual vector technique. And so I told you earlier that one of the downsides to AAV is its packaging capacity. You cannot fit a gene greater than 5 kb uh, into a AAV vector. But what can be done, and this can only be done when you have super high transduction efficiency, you can actually take a gene that's too large to fit into a single AAV and you can um, divide it in two, and add some regulatory elements. Each gets packaged in a separate vector, and then both are co-administered. And this results in transfection by um, both the five prime and the three prime region of the gene. There are some um, uh, sequences that are placed that allow for recombination. And, uh, and then this recombination event occurs results in translation of full length protein and, um, uh, and function. And so for this particular example, what we did was we took the GFP gene, uh, which actually is, is small enough to fit in an AAV vector, but we broke it into, uh, packaged each separately, and then uh, co-administered them together. And that's what you're looking at on the figure on the right-hand side. So these are four monkeys, all the same uh, dose, 7.2 E11, and you see near 100% um, transduction. You will not see GFP, by the way, if um, you don't get uh, the recombination. So the five prime by itself or the three prime by itself will not give you fluorescence. And so this represents um, animals that had a um, co-transfection um, recombination and expression. And it's um, even even with a dual vector, which is more, which is much more inefficient than a single vector, we still see expression levels that make us believe that we can use this for uh, larger genes by this technique. So I'm going to talk about now, just in the time that we have remaining, about a, a couple of examples of 
of what we are working on right now. Um, Odo Ferlin will probably be our first program that makes it to the clinic. Um, so patients, this is an autosomal um, recessive disorder. Um, patients are born with um, bile allelic pathogenic mutations in the otoferlin gene, relatively rare. We think that there's about 200 to 300 new cases per year in the United States and Europe. And otoferlin is necessary for the release of, of synaptic uh, vesicles and neurotransmitter uh, at the um, hair cell uh, auditory neuron synapse. Um, or so-called ribbon synapses. So if, if an individual is lacking otoferlin, there's no release of neurotransmitter at the ribbon synapse, and there's no transmission of a signal from the hair cell to the auditory nerve. So these individuals are born profoundly deaf. They have an auditory neuropathy phenotype, which means the ABR is absent, but OAEs are present. Um, and we know from work in animals, um, knockouts, that the cochlea in these individuals develop, um, complete, or at least in animals that are knocked out, develop completely normally. So it doesn't result in a developmental uh, problem. And so we have um, otoferlin knockout mice that have the um, exact phenotype that we see in the humans. So OAE is present, ABR absent, these um, mice are uh, profoundly deaf. And you can see the figure on the left, if you can see that the knockout has no hearing or no response uh, by ABR, even at the highest thresholds. Um, and if you add back in um, the uh, otoferlin gene, it restores the hearing in the knockout uh, to the range that we see in the wild type. And on the graft on the right, this is actually a similar experiment, but instead of using the mouse otoferlin gene, we actually put back the human copy of the otoferlin gene, which is going to be similar to what uh, the product that we'd be using in the clinic. And you see again that um, by doing so, even with the human copy of the otoferlin gene, uh, hearing is restored back into the wild type range. And so this is what gives us um, proof of concept that this should work. Um, just another example of that, this is the, now you're looking actually at the ABR tracings, um, wild type uh, mouse on the uh, left. Um, this is the non-treated, in the middle is the non-treated uh, otoferlin um, knockout. And you see there's no response at all, even at 100 uh, dB. And then we've added back in the, um, actually again, the human copy of the otoferlin gene using ANK80, and you see a restoration of the ABR um, to uh, really what is normal. Um, you might think there's a little difference between the wild type and the otoferlin knockout treated uh, with um, ANK80 otoferlin. But really, this is more than anything else is just an artifact of the test system. So the wild type mouse has, you know, two normal hearing ears. And if you look at 60 dB, which is, you know, uh, threshold here, the pattern between the otoferlin knockout, treated knockout and the wild type is identical. And then as you start to get up to higher threshold, 70, 80 dB, um, what, what happens in the wild type is there's a crossover and you're actually stimulating both ears, the, um, uh, including the contralateral normal ear, whereas in the otoferlin knockout, the contralateral ear is deaf. And so this is a summation of both ears, whereas this is just one ear. But very compelling um, evidence that this uh, should work in humans. So <clears throat> there are other um, uh, uses for gene therapy other than uh, monogenic deafness. Um, and this could be to treat um, complex disease where we actually have a very good handle on the biology. Um, and one example of that is um, uh, a project that's emerging uh, to treat 
small progressive uh, unilateral vestibular schwannomas. So the basis of this is that um, uh, we know that um, VEGF is highly upregulated in vestibular schwannomas, including uh, non-NF2 tumors. That systemic avastin or bevacizumab, when you give it um, to uh, patients with NF2 and bilateral vestibular schwannomas, uh, results in a significant reduction uh, in tumor size in about 50% of patients, 90 plus percent of patients either have a reduction in tumor size or a rest of progression. Um, and also about 50% of them uh, experience improvement in hearing. The problem with systemic avastin is that um, you can only give so much of it. It has a, a significant toxicity associated with it, especially renal. So and it's cumulative over time. So you can't just give a patient systemic avastin for the rest of their uh, life. And so the idea here is if you put in a gene for an anti-VEGF protein that is secreted into the perilymph because of its target proximity um, to the uh, vestibular schwannoma, you can get low level expression of, of an anti-VEGF protein that may um, arrest the progression of the tumor without resulting in the uh, long-term systemic side effects associated with systemic administration. So initially we envisioned doing this in patients with small tumors, predominantly intracanalicular, um, that are growing and they're headed towards um, definitive treatment, either surgery or radiation. And if it proves effective in the small tumors, then we will um, uh, look at other potential applications, including larger tumors and maybe eventually the NF2 population. But right now, this is for just the sporadic, small sporadics that are progressing towards active treatment. And just some of the literature to support this. So as I mentioned before, one of our um, co-founders is Richard Smith, uh, University of Iowa. Richard has really um, been one of the real pioneers in the area of hereditary deafness. Um, uh, most of you know that uh, uh, their uh, genetic testing platform is called Otoscope. It looks at 152 uh, different uh, genes that have been associated with hearing loss. I've been out to visit Richard a few times and really, um, it's really an amazing setup that they have in Iowa. So um, they receive samples from all over the place. Um, every um, uh, patient is discussed in a large group setting with um, bioinformatics um, as well as genetics. And they've made significant progress in understanding, um, you know, which variants are pathogenic and which variants are not, which is a very important part of what we do. The one thing that really amazes me um, as I have gotten into this area is how few patients with suspected uh, genetic sensory neural hearing loss undergo genetic testing. And, and, and you know, obviously the reason for this is one, there's a cost associated with it. Um, and two, up until now or till recently, it really did not impact the decision-making process of what you would do with this patient. I mean, a patient's profoundly deaf since birth, they're gonna get a cochlear implant and doesn't matter whether or not it's caused by otoferlin or some other gene, it's the same treatment regardless. So what, what advantage is there to doing genetic testing? And obviously with the um, emergence of gene therapy, uh, as a potential treatment, it becomes essential to know what the um, uh, uh, genotype is, when it's essential to know what the mutation is. And in fact, for this field to really reach its full potential, one of the things that is going to have to happen is a significant increase in the amount of uh, genetic testing that we do. We need this to understand the landscape. We need it to understand um, uh, phenotype, genotype, associations, um, and we needed to understand the natural history of this disorder. So for example, otoferlin, these children are born profoundly deaf, but there are other genetic forms of deafness 
where children will pass their um, uh, newborn screening test um, and will begin to lose hearing and, with time. And one of the things that has been proposed, um, and these are two position papers, one from China and one from here in the States, is that it would be much more efficient um, to not only screen patients with physiology, OAEs and ABR, really it should be ABR. You know, if you screen with OAEs and lots of places do, you're gonna miss all of these auditory neuropathy phenotype um, patients. And then they're gonna be released. They're not gonna represent again until they're really having problems. And now you're behind the eight ball in terms of uh, rehabilitating these patients. And so what has been suggested is that in addition to physiologic testing, that there should be a gene panel run on all of these, on all kids that are born. And in China, when they did a combination of um, physiology and a genetic screen, they increased their yield of identification of at-risk children four to five fold. And so, you know, where that would be helpful would be if a child passed their newborn screen, but they ended up um, having a, a hit on their um, panel, um, that you're gonna follow that child much, much more closely uh, and that, you know, you pro this child will probably get hearing aids at a more appropriate point in time than they would be if they were just left on their own. So we think that this is something that um, could really change the field significantly. One of the things that we have invested a large amount of resource and effort into is developing a uh, observation global research registry. So this is something that we're doing um, across the globe in Japan, Taiwan, Europe, uh, and the United States. And this is a um, registry where we are collecting um, clinical information on these patients, hopefully genetic information, and then we follow them uh, over time for at least 10 years, if not longer. This, the data for this is something that we envision will be available to all researchers. This is not something that we want to own for our own purpose, but we think will be essential to uh, really for the field to develop. And th this is well underway at the moment. So um, in summary, uh, AAD gene therapy uh, is an FDA, FDA approved treatment modality, which shows great promise for use for disorders of the inner ear. Uh, the delivery, both surgical um, and molecular, uh, is critical uh, to this process. So you need to have the right surgical approach. You need to have the right vector in order for this to work. And we think that genetic testing is gonna play a very important role in identifying patients who could benefit from potential future therapies. So um, I think I'll end with that.